in uh, Luke 7, verse 1, we've been on this for a few weeks now, and I sense that we're getting close to the, uh, the, the summing of up of this series. We're called The Greatest Faith. And if you haven't been with us, uh, we encourage you to go online and get caught up with us. It won't cost you anything to watch or listen or download the previous messages. I think this is number 12. And so, uh, and if you want a hard copy out in uh, Word Supply here and in Sarasota, they'll get you a CD or DVD. Again, it won't cost you anything. And uh, we're, we're looking at and have looked at the two examples Jesus called the greatest faith he had ever seen. <laughs> he said, I hadn't seen faith like this anywhere in the country. And so uh, verse 1, when he had ended these sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, a certain centurion's servant. This was a Roman soldier, an officer that trained and led other soldiers. He had a servant. Now I want you to notice how many times you see this word servant. Centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. When he had heard of Jesus, that's where all faith begins. Yes. Yeah. Comes by hearing. He sent to him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. There's that word again. And when they, be, they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loves our nation, and he's built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord... Trouble not yourself, for I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Now, those of us who've come up under word and faith circles, or charismatic circles, we don't like the sound of that, I'm not worthy. <laughs> but it's still true. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Somebody says, yeah, but I'm the righteousness of God. Don't leave off those last two words. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Anybody know the rest of that verse? Yes. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. In yourself, you're nothing. Now your flesh don't like to hear that. But it's still true. In your flesh and who you are after the flesh and what you've done in life after the flesh does not merit you any blessing. Does not make you deserve good things from God. And so based on who you are naturally, you're not worthy of anything the Lord would do for you. And if you come acting like you are, then you make it impossible for Him to be gracious to you. I need to explain that, don't I? If you come acting entitled Lord, I've been a good Christian. I've gone to church a lot. I've given to this. I've given to that. You know, you should heal me. <laughs> First of all, he's already bought and paid for your healing. Hmm? For you ever came along. Right? Secondly, he does not owe you healing because of how good you've been. Or the meeting of your needs. Or anything. The reason Jesus had to come is because the best we could do was filthy rags. Now, you know, the flesh and the unrenewed mind doesn't like this. This is a big, big deal. This is what uh, Paul deals with through half the New Testament, the Spirit of God through him. This is what grace is. Grace means... You don't deserve it. Grace means you haven't earned it. You can't. You don't. Everything God has given us is a free, undeserved gift. Hmm? 
And if you think it's owed to you for some reason, even if God graciously gave you something, you wouldn't appreciate it because you'd think you deserve it. You wouldn't even be thankful. You make it, you understand the phrase, you make it impossible for God or anybody else. If you think something's owed to you, you're entitled, it's owed to you, you make it impossible for God or people to be gracious to you. There, we're looking at one of the biggest reasons why this man is one of only two in the scriptures that Jesus said had the greatest faith. What is it about this man that's different from Jesus' own disciples? Huh? Because when he said, I hadn't seen faith like this anywhere in the country. His, the twelve are there with him. Yeah, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we know one of their issues. We also got passages that said they argued yeah. about who was the greatest yeah. and who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Because Jesus talked so much about the kingdom that they're vying for the top spots in the kingdom. And we should talk a lot about the kingdom because in just a very little while, it's the only kingdom that's going to exist is the kingdom of God. And what we're doing now in this life affects our place in the kingdom. Not whether we're saved or not, but our position in the kingdom. If you don't think that, you need to pick this book up and read it some more. Read it closer. Keep reading this. The centurion said, I'm not worthy because of who I am, because of what I am, that you should come even enter under my roof. Humility. The real thing. Humility is inseparable from faith. Keep going. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come to you. The only reason we're worthy is because he has made us worthy with his own blood. The Lord doesn't owe me healing. He gave me healing. Hallelujah. He doesn't owe me a good life hmm? or my bills paid or a good place to live or something good to wear or something good to eat. He owes me none of this. I've had, I've had people, even fellow ministers, who should know better. When the Lord did something good for Phyllis and I, say, oh, well, you know, y'all work so hard. You deserve it. I'm glad to say you deserve it. I, I want to correct them right on the spot. Sometimes I do. I, I don't deserve it but I get to enjoy it anyway. Yes. <laughs> yes. Huh? Yes, this ain't about what you deserve. Right. Yeah. Hmm? That's true. We didn't deserve any of it. Right. If we got what we deserved, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah. And the wages of sin yeah. is death. Yeah. That's what you deserved. Yeah. Period. Yes. But oh. the best news you ever heard yeah. The gospel is that Jesus, who didn't deserve any punishment, who never sinned, took your place, took my place, became sin with my sin. The judgment fell on him there, died in my place, went to the heart of the earth, paid the price so I wouldn't have to. So you wouldn't have to. Did he deserve what he got? On the cross? No, but he took it. So you could get what you don't deserve in blessings and benefits. I want everybody to open your mouth and say this. Now, this is very important that you say it. Say it out loud. Jesus, Jesus took my place. Took my place. Therefore, Therefore, I deserve, I deserve no, punishment. no punishment. No judgment, no judgment. Should, come should come against me. Because he took it. He He paid for it. it. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's made me clean by his blood. He's made me holy. I didn't work my way up to be holy. He just, he made me holy. 
He's made me righteous. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I couldn't have gotten there. With no matter how much I prayed or worked or tried to be good, the Bible tells me I would never have gotten there on my own. I could not get no, there. No. No. Why Jesus had to come to get me where I couldn't go. Yeah. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Boldly yes. right into the presence of the Almighty. An eternal place in the eternal family of God. And if I'll be faithful, a significant place ruling and reigning with him in his kingdom forever. We've barely scratched the surface of what we've been given. But you must not come with an attitude of entitlement. You know, just because you were born and you're on the planet, somebody owes you something. That's a bad attitude. And it'll cut you off from many blessings. Why is this man here? Somehow, even though he's a soldier, he's used to giving orders, but he's also used to taking orders. He had this revelation when he heard about Jesus and saw what was happening in Jesus' life and ministry. He thought, uh, you know, he probably didn't realize that this is the Messiah, the Christ, but he saw this man's being used of God. This man hears from God. This man has authority. Huh? If I can just get him to give the order, we can get what my servant needs. Right? And I have no right to come tell him anything or demand anything of him or require anything. We're making a request as humbly as we know how. Come on, can you see this? You don't know us anything, Jesus. You don't need, you don't need to come to my house. Let's keep reading. He said, if you just, but just say in a word and my servant shall be healed. Give the command and my servant shall be healed. This is how miracles happen. Faith commands. And faith commands are connected to humility and submission. Many times people have not connected the submission to faith. They think, well, that's, you know, that's another subject. Let's talk about that some What I need right now is faith. You can't separate the two. Do you remember James 4, 6, and 7? It said, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. But is there something comes before resisting the devil and him fleeing? First thing is, you, it's understood subject, submit yourself to God. You've got to give God his place over you. Give him the place that he rightfully has. Take your place under him. Then you'll be in a position to have faith to make the devil take his place under your feet. And he'll have to run. He's got no choice. But if you're you're being defiant, rebellious, you're yielding to the enemy. That's his nature. And if you're yielding to him, he knows he doesn't have to yield to you. So you can holler and bark orders all you want to. Nothing's going to happen. The place of submission is the place of protection and power. Hallelujah. We, we can of our own self do nothing. But in him... We can do all things through the anointed one. The, the enemy is not just personally afraid of you after the flesh, but who you are in Christ and that name that you've been given. And if you submit to the Father and do what he tells you to do, then you can give a command of faith and you have to be obeyed, whether it's elements or the enemy. So if you've been given commands and nothing's been happening, check up on how well you've been following commands. <laughs> Keep reading. I didn't intend to say, I hadn't said that yet in this series ever. I believe that was the Lord. He said, I, I'm a man under authority. I have under me soldiers. I say to one, go. And what happens? This is the Roman army. You don't say, I don't feel like it. <laughs> when you get an order to go, 
You better go. I say to another, come. What happens? He comes. And I, I say to my servant, here, here's the word servant again. You'll see the word servant some five times just in, in these few verses. Servant, do this, and what happens? He does it. Our God is so great. We have very, very little idea. Now the Bible tells us that even His eternal power and Godhead are seen, clearly seen, in His creation. Don't look in men's theology books to learn who God is and what God is. Look in the night sky. Hmm? This, I'm, this is according to God in Romans. He said, that's how you'll see about me. Look at the, the mountain ranges. Look at the Pacific Ocean. Hmm? Look at the sun. Not for too long. <laughs> Look at the pictures of we have now uh, of the galaxy. Yes. Oh, that's God. Yes. That's who He is. That's what He is. When you begin to get a, just a little bit of a realization of who He is, you've got no problem doing this. Yes. 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 Huh? If you do, you are woefully ignorant of who you're even dealing with. What kind of being can create the sun? The surface is 10,000 degrees. <laughs> it's, the pressures are amazing. We're what, 90, uh, I mean it's summertime, feels pretty hot, but we're like 95 million miles away from it. 95 million. A little bit closer, whew. You wouldn't know what hot it is. You'd find out. A little bit further, all glaciers and froze over. And people choose to believe it just randomly happened. <laughs> I was looking the other, the other day about a total eclipse of the sun. And a total eclipse, uh, even though the moon is 400 times uh, smaller than the sun, it's uh, 400 times closer to us than the sun, which makes a perfect disk to cover it on the total eclipse. Isn't that a coincidence? <laughs> In the scope of the galaxy, this kind of precision? You're a fool to doubt and reject the notion of the Creator God. Just a fool. And of course, one of the big motivations to reject this is so that you don't have to submit to anybody. This is the nature of the devil himself. If I can say, no, we evolved. It was from the goo to the zoo to you. <laughs> Somebody say, you're making fun of proven science. Am not. There's a reason why they call it theories. Hmm? And, and it defies the laws of physics. Every mutation is a loss of information. Doesn't develop into a higher state of being. People who really in the know, they're dishonest about this stuff. That's another subject. What do you believe? I believe the front of this book. Genesis 1-1. In the beginning. Nobody can tell me I'm wrong. They weren't there. They got no records. <laughs> In the beginning. God. Who now is my father. My daddy. Because of what my brother Jesus did for me. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you have even a glimpse of the reality of this, you've got no problem bowing your knee. And what we're going to see in just a moment, 
declaring yourself a servant yes. of God yes. and seeking to serve his purposes and to please him. And if you, if you live your whole life and you never seek that, I know I've used the word, but, but it's just being an absolute fool. Because yeah. 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 you're going to find out when you breathe your last yes, sir. what's true. And all your dumb theories are going to be out the window. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But it can be too late for some things. Yes. We have this opportunity in this short life. Our heart is proven. Whether we'll be honest about what we sense and know in our heart and mind and submit to our Father, our Creator, or whether we'll be defiant and rebellious and yield to the evil one, the devil, his enemy. Have you made your choice? Yes. Come on, have you made your choice? Yes. Then if you've got understanding at all, you have no problem bowing your knee and humbling. Somebody say humbling. humbling. Uh, this is not something God's going to make you do or anybody else going to make you do. You humble yourself. You submit yourself. You, you lose the attitude. You lose all this talk of deserving and entitlement. And you worship and you show gratitude that you exist. How many are thankful for gravity? Come on. You'd be floating off the planet. If you didn't. Is that right? Come on, somebody say, thank you, Lord. For gravity. Come on, take a big breath. Take a big breath. A lot of these other planets in our solar system, you'd be breathing methane. Methane. <laughs> you couldn't make it. How did, isn't it wonderful? God put some oxygen here. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The synapses in your brain enabling you to think. I mean, thing after thing after thing. God is so vast and so great and great faith in him begins with a simple acknowledgement of how big he is, how powerful he is, how all-knowing, how all-wise he is and giving him that place and taking under him willingly because in this life he forces no man. Now there's people who try to tell you different but they're wrong. If God was going to force anybody of these billions of people on the planet to do anything, he'd force them to receive Jesus and be born again so that they're not eternally lost. If he's going to force anybody to do anything, he'd do that. And he won't. If he won't force you to do that, he won't force you to do anything. You can rebel against him every day of your short life on this planet. You can ignore everything he tells you to do. You know that's true. Billions are doing it. You can reject him and worship a rock. You can worship the moon. You can, you know, do any kind of stupid thing. You can believe anything you choose to, any lies. You can ignore him your whole life. He will let you. But you, all you did was demonstrate you're not worthy to be with him for eternity because you refuse to choose him. But those who do choose him and willingly bow the knee and seek to obey, find his plan and do it in this life, he will never forget it. He will never forget it. And you'll experience eternal place with him and eternal reward. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's finish reading this. Jesus marveled at him, turned him about and said to the people that followed, I say to you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. Oh, somebody say, thank you, Lord. He was about dead. He was in pain. He was in a bad way. And uh, now he's completely healed. Just like that. Whew. Jesus didn't even come to the house. Didn't even touch him. Nope. Didn't even pray for him. <laughs> Why did that happen to this man? 
on this day. Because somebody dared to step out and ask. Hallelujah. Humbly. Confident that the Lord could give the command. Hallelujah. Can you and I have faith like that today? Yes, we can. Go with me just a few pages over to the 17th chapter of Luke. Luke 17. Thanks be to God. Luke 17 and verse 5. Now we've been talking about this. But you'll see that the disciples apparently didn't forget this. <laughs> and they, G, Jesus acknowledged somebody had more faith than them. <laughs> and, and at this point they say, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> we, we want big faith. <laughs> now, he had just got through telling them that if somebody sinned against them they should, and comes and wants to make it right, they should forgive them. And if they do it seven times in the same day, they should forgive them seven times in the day. And their next response was, Lord, would you increase our faith? And it is true, you forgive by faith, not by feeling. Come on, say it out loud, I forgive by faith, not by feeling. Because this is what's confused a lot of people. They, they say, okay, I forgive you, I forgive you. And then maybe the person goes off and acts like a heathen again. Or uh, the enemy brings to your mind and replays what they said, what they did. You get all upset. You get worked up. The devil says, you had not forgiven them. See, 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 you haven't forgiven them. Yeah. Well, see, you're basing that entirely on your feelings. You don't forgive by feelings. You forgive by faith. It's comparable to the release of a debt. In fact, remember the Lord's Prayer? You know, forgive us this day our, our debts as we forgive our debtors. Why talk about debt with forgiveness? Because it's the same. Uh, if, you know, somebody owed you $10,000 and you decided you're going to forgive them that debt and you call them and you got the paperwork. <laughs> I got people looking around and going, I ain't doing that. <laughs> <laughs> then you won't be forgiven. Yeah. According to the Father. Uh, and, and you got the paperwork on the $10,000 debt. And you say, you know, the Lord's debt with me. And I'm, I for, I'm forgiving you this debt. I've got a notary public right here. And, and we're going to put paid in full here and they stamp it and, and here's the paperwork and in fact I'm tearing up my stuff that I have. You are forgiven of that debt. Right. Well, let's say end of the week you got a big bill comes up and you could really use that money. <laughs> and you think, man, what did I do that for? Yeah, but did you or not? Yes. Hmm? Yeah. Did, you or, did you do it or not? Yes. No matter how you feel, yeah. you did it. Right? right? And you can forgive somebody no matter how you feel. You come back and say, no, it doesn't matter how I feel. I forgave them by faith. Hmm? They owe me nothing. They don't owe me to make it right. They don't owe me an ex explanation. They don't owe me an apology. They owe me nothing. Now, the reason we're on this is because someone hasn't forgiven and it's been hurting you. It's been, it's been access for the enemy to get to you and cause you problems. And you need to do it. And if you say you can't, you're stuck in a bad place. You're going to keep having those same problems. How many are ready to get, get free and get clear and shut the door so the enemy doesn't have access to you? So then you need to mean business with this prayer. Close your eyes and mean business with this prayer. Say it out loud, Father God. Father God. All those who've done me wrong. I choose, I choose to, forgive. to forgive. You have forgiven me, you have forgiven me though I didn't deserve it. Deserve it. And, I and I choose to forgive them. To forgive them. They, don't to they don't have to deserve it. I ask you, I ask you to, forgive to forgive them. Don't hold that, don't hold that against their charge. Against their charge. I, say, I say in Jesus' name, 
They owe me nothing. They don't owe me an apology, an explanation, or to make it right. I choose by faith. I forgive them. They are released from any obligation. They owe me nothing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you do it? Did you do it? Then no matter what you think or feel, tomorrow, the next day, you say, well, that doesn't matter. I, I forgave them. I tore up the paperwork. Right? Doesn't matter. And if you do that, the Father says, he'll forgive you. And, if you, and, and, and in that case, the enemy has no right to you. No access to you. Keep going. Luke 17, are you there? I'm reading the Weist translation. Or whooshed, depending on how you pronounce it. Said, uh, they said, Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith, like a grain of mustard seed. Now, now here's, here's a great revelation. So many times people are wanting more of something. And the Lord will, again and again, he'll tell you, use what you've got. People say, I, I need more, I need more. And I'm telling you. Again and again, if you, if you actually hear from him, he'll tell you, use what you got. Do you remember when they had those thousands of people out on the hillside and the disciples told the Lord they're hungry. Send them away so they can buy some groceries. What did he say? What do you have? Right? You remember the woman uh, who they're about to come, creditors come and take her children away and she sent word to the prophet, I need help, I need a miracle. What did he say? What do you have? I don't have anything except this little pot. That's how the Lord works though. We don't have anything except these uh, two small fish and these few little pieces of bread. Then Jesus smiled and go, that's it, we got it. <laughs> All we need is a seed. See, we're thinking we need the whole thing. No, you don't. You need a seed. You need a seed. Give God something he can bless. Give him something to work with. But if he multiplies zero times a million, what do you got? Big old zero. You got to give him something to bless, something to multiply. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would in that case say to this sycamine tree, what got the miracle for the centurion servant? Jesus said something. Is that right? Be it unto you as you've believed. Uh, if you, you would say, be pulled up by the roots, be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. People act like that's a fantastical statement. It's how the tree got here to start with. It's how the ocean got here. It's how the mountain got here to start with. God spoke. It's how light came into being. Right? Shouldn't be a shocking thing to us that what was created by words could be affected by words. Keep going. Now, who of you having a slave? That's servant in the King James. He starts talking about a servant. Answering their question about increasing faith. What does a servant have to do with faith? Can you see that one of the two great faith examples was over a servant being healed. Right? Yes. And one of the great revelations that we see that the man had was when he tells his servant to do something, he does it. So when they say increase our faith, he talks to them about speaking and about a servant. <laughs> speaking. And he says, now, who of you having a slave... And see, uh, our generation, we, we don't like that word. No. Right. Somebody says, well, uh, no, slavery is wrong. Forced servanthood is wrong. Yeah. There's another kind. Yeah. Hmm? I said, there's another kind. Stealing somebody, turning them into your property, forcing them to be a slave to you is wrong. That's the enemy. He's the coercer. He's the thief. He's the forcer. 
God's looking for people who want to be his servants. Hallelujah. He's not going to make you be. (laughs) Now, eventually, all the people who don't want to be, he's going to remove them from us and put them somewhere else where we never see them. You don't want to be in that bunch. But you don't want to live with, living with you either. No, you don't. Somebody that rebelled against God their whole life and are never going to change, you want them living by you for eternity? No, you don't. Only God knows when somebody's never going to change. And you might think, well, there, there always be a chance that they'll change. No, God knows. The devil, for instance, is never going to change. And God knows that. When he's, when he's put in the pit for a thousand years, you know the first thing he does when he gets out? He goes right back to, to leading a rebellion against God. Instantly. What does this prove? You could lock him up there for a hundred thousand years. What's he going to do when he gets out? He's never going to change. So the only, only solution is remove him from us. Somewhere that we'll never, never have to deal with him anymore. And sadly, Many human beings are, are going to follow him. And they don't want to submit to anybody. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. They're not going to bow their knee. They, they, they have submitted to his. I, I'm convinced the biggest problem we got on the planet is mass rebellion against God. People refuse to listen and do what he says. He'll allow it for a while. Then he's got to separate. But here... Which of you having a slave servant in the King James, plowing or tending a flock of sheep, who having come out of the field will say to him, having arrived, go at once and have your meal. This is, this is a person's servant. They've been out in the, in the field working all day and they come in and he says, you don't tell your servant, will you eat and then take care of me. <laughs> See, even talking about this, people say, well, I don't like that. I know the devil can't stand it. Defiance, rebellion. Nobody tells me what to do. If you yield to that, you're yielding to the nature of the devil himself. Certainly, it's wrong to force somebody to be your slave. But there's another kind. Of servant. Hallelujah. Where you willingly. Submit yourself. To be at his service. I want you to listen. I I noticed this last night. The, The introduction. Of numerous of our letters. Start like this. Second Peter says. Simon Peter. A servant. And an apostle. Of Jesus Christ. He doesn't lead with apostle. He leads with servant. Uh, James, you know how he starts his out? James 1 1. James, a servant yes. of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Paul says the same thing multiple places. Paul, a servant of God yes. and an apostle yes. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Hmm? I think a lot of people, they take the apostle and take it off the right side of the name and put it on the left side. Right. Use it as a title. Don't even use the servant designation. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do, do you understand? They didn't use apostle, prophet as titles. Right. No. No. They, they said, I am one. But they didn't call themselves the apostle this. I know some folks don't like that, but study the scripture. See what it says. Jesus specifically told us, don't call people your spiritual father. How many people are breaking that one? Don't call people your spiritual master. Did he say it? (laughs) It's in the Bible, friends. Don't do it. Here's something you and I should delight to say. I'm Keith, a servant, a servant of God, and I can say, and a pastor or, or whatever, but I'm a servant of God. Does that make you somebody? Considering who he is? 
if you're anything to him, you're somebody in the universe forever. If you're nothing to him, you're nothing in the future. Does anybody like that designation? Huh? I'm Joe, Tom, Sally, Susie, a servant. Somebody say, a servant of God. Will you say that out your own, on your mouth? Say, a servant of God. See, nobody's making me be a servant of God. I choose to yield myself and submit myself to, yes, he's made me his son. That's true too. But a son can also serve. Yes, yes, right? Yes. A son, a daughter can serve yes. and should. Yes. For his pleasure, yes. we are created. Yes. Hallelujah. At his service should be our daily thought. Right? Lord, I am yours to command. Everything I have, everything under my hand, under my control is available to you. Somebody say, well, it's all his, not if he gave it to you. If it's all his, you've got nothing to give him. No, he said the tithe was his, but the rest of it that he gave to you, it's yours to do with what you will. But you should make it available to him. Is that right? Because unless he helps you keep it, you're going to lose it anyway. And <laughs> Right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of things there, but you should make it available to him. Right? Good strong body. Best use of your health is serving God. Best use of your youth. Right? Is serving God. Best use of your talents, your abilities, your skills, your graces is serving God. Best use of your equipment. Right? Is serving God. Somebody say, I am a servant of the Lord. Hallelujah. And he describes the servant mentality. Which if you're going to have the greatest faith, you must have. Like the centurion and like the Syrophoenician woman. You must have the humility and the submission. What is the servant mentality? Not somebody who was forced into slavery. Somebody who volunteered. <laughs> Somebody said, who would volunteer to be a slave? We're talking about God. Can we all with me? I'm not talking about being your slave. I'm talking about being God's slave. Right? Now that includes me doing some things for you, whatever he tells me. But his slave is the greatest thing you could ever be. Right? The creator of the universe. I'm his servant. He also, in his grace, made me his child, his son. Hallelujah. Whew. Read the mentality of the servant. He said, which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending a flock of sheep, come in out of the field, you'll say to him, since you've come here, go have your meal. He said, you won't say that. That's not what a slave does. You'll say, Prepare at once something in order that I may have my dinner and attire yourself for serving me. Wait on me till I eat and drink. And after these things, you eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things that were commanded. Does he? What are we talking about? Servant mentality. What else are we talking about? The greatest faith there is. Got to have one to have the other. This is revelation. Isn't it? This is revelation. He said, does he thank him? Bless people's hearts. It's a lot how you grow up. But there are folks that won't pass you a pencil without holding on to the other end. They say, is there something you wanted to say? <laughs> <laughs> there are many I talk to other pastors all the time I, uh, I'm so thankful for our people <laughs> we got some of the best you've ever seen but there are a lot of people if you don't 
you know, you know, layer them with accolades and acknowledgement, yes. they will quit. Yes. They, if, if you don't have them stand up on a regular basis and talk about what a good job they're doing, they will stop. They will quit. That means they're not givers. That's right. yes. Even if they're working for no pay, they want their pay. Yes. They want acknowledgement yes. and recognition yes. as pay. So they're not giving, no. they're trading. Right. <laughs> they want something in exchange for what they're doing. You hear mothers, you hear spouses say, I gave them the best years of my life and now when I need something, no, then you didn't give it. You're saying now I want to get paid. <laughs> then you didn't give them anything. <laughs> if you gave them anything, if it's a free gift, there are no strings and you won't ask for anything in return. Elsewise, it's not a gift. Hmm? Well, they don't appreciate me. Who said they had to? <laughs> you hear people say, oh, God, use me. Oh, God, please use me. Oh, God, please use me. And he lets them get involved in a place where the things are going on, and they get real busy, and things are asked of them, and then they go, I just feel so used. <laughs> Well, make up your mind that you want to get used or you don't want to be used. <laughs> what do I, is this relevant yes. to us right now? Hmm? I know you have things you need miracles in your life for. I don't have to know any details. I know you do. I know God can do anything. Nothing's too hard for him. Yes, sir. I know faith is the key, yeah. right? right? Trusting him, hearing from him, believing him, obeying him, and great miracles are attached to great faith. And I think we should do this now. Great faith is attached to a servant yeah. mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. A servant mentality. Yes. What does he say how you should think? They said increase our faith. Yes. He said, well... If you had any faith at all, <laughs> mustard seed faith, side, you would say. Yes. Hmm? Yeah. And it, it would obey you. Everybody say obey you. obey you. But what do we know about something obeying you? It's directly connected to how well you obey him. Yes. Hmm? Yes. How well you obey him. That's right. yes. If you don't obey him, there will be condemnation that will hinder your confidence from expecting something to be obeyed when you say it. Yes. It just undercuts your faith. Condemnation is the confidence faith destroyer. But then also, he says this, look at this attitude here. He said, does he thank him because he, he did that? He's been working all day. You come in <laughs> and uh, so the, the master says, there you are. I'm hungry. Take care of me. So you say, yes, right away. And so you go wash up and clean up, put on some clean clothes because you've been working out in the field, and you go prepare a top-notch meal. And you set the table and you serve them and take care of them. And then you are not thanked. <laughs> and most people, they say, I'm out of here. I don't have to put up with this. And no, you don't. You can be like other heathen who won't even acknowledge God and don't want to serve him. Jesus said, the greatest of all will be the servant of all. Didn't he say that? Hmm? Is there a connection here? The greatest faith, the greatest servant. The greatest of all will be the servant of all. Does he thank that slave because he did the things which were commanded. He does not. Does he? No. And so then the servant gets all hurt and mad and bitter and goes, nobody appreciates what I do around here. I've had it. 
I'm not taking this. <laughs> I know a friend of mine some years ago, they uh, uh, built a church. He's a carpenter, hard worker, their own money, their own labor. They built this new building. And uh, <laughs> he called into the uh, uh, office there at Ramah after Christmas time and said, you need to find somebody to come up here and take this church. He said, what? I thought you just got your new building. He said, yeah, but these people don't appreciate me. And uh, you need to find somebody to come up. They don't appreciate me and my wife, what we've done. You need to find somebody to uh, uh, come up here and take this. And he said, now hold on. Don't, don't move so quick. Tell me what, what is all this about? He said, well, you know, it's Christmas for one thing. Yeah. He said, do you know what? The whole congregation got together and gave my wife and I for Christmas. I said, no. A five by seven picture of Jesus. <laughs> he said, after everything we've done, after all, everything we've given, you know, then appreciate. And, and, and this man he was talking to had some wisdom. He said, now hold on. I, you told me, and I saw the miracles that God sent you there. Yes. Yeah? Has he released you to leave and go somewhere else? See, many people are led in by the Spirit and led out by an offense, which is not God. Yeah, but I don't, I don't have to put up with that. If the Lord tells you to, you do. Peter says, submit to those that are over you, even the froward. You know what froward means? Hard. Unfair. He said, well, uh, did the Lord tell you to stay unless they don't appreciate you? <laughs> so we got this thing in our mind. People don't have to appreciate you for you to obey God. Right. Whose servant are you yeah. anyway? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Are you a giver? Yeah. Or do you have to have your pay of acknowledgement and thanks? Are you going to quit? So many people just quit, quit, yeah. quit, 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 quit. And that means you won't be at the next place very long until somebody rubs you the wrong way or don't give you what you want. You're going to quit that. Yes. Right? Yes, next thing you know, you're old, your life is done. You look up, you're leaving here right. and you've quit everything that you should have completed. Yeah. Yeah. Won't have the reward that you should. Right. You're saved, but you won't have the reward. No. The Bible said endure hardness yeah. as a good soldier. Yeah. More than once, Phyllis and I have been in situations in these almost 40 years of ministry now that was uncomfortable. Un, whew. I wouldn't go through it again for large sums of money. I'd just say, no, no, no thanks. Mm -mm. There's been times I fell across the bed and put in a request for a transfer. Lord, where else could you use me? What else could you do? And it came back. Denied. <laughs> now I got a choice. Yes. Right? right? Who's, come on, say that loud. Whose servant Who am I? Am I? That's right. It takes faith to go where you're sent yes. when you want to stay where you are. Yeah. It takes faith to stay where you're stationed yes. when you want to leave. It takes faith. It takes trust. Yes. Yes. Doesn't it? Yes. To say, well, okay, Lord, yes. if that's what you say, I will gird up my loins yes. and act like a man. Yes. I will endure hardness yes. as a good soldier, trusting that you're going to take care of me no matter what they do or don't do, who likes me, who don't, right? right? Yes. Who appreciates me? Who doesn't? I'm not their servant. I'm your servant. And I know he appreciates me. He will never forget it. Right? I don't need you to prop me up all the time or I'm going to quit. You shouldn't need me to prop you up all the time. Are you going to quit? We should be able to work, work, and then more asked of us and we don't get thanks and we're fine. We just say, read the last phrase. What do you say? We're servants. We've done nothing more than what was commanded us. We're not deserving of any meritorious mention. We have done that which we ought to have done. That's my job. That's what I should have done. 
I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do. Right? Popular, unpopular, still do the same thing. Preach the good word in season, out of season. Huh? Good letters, ugly grams. Still, still preach. People saying, praise God, we love you. People marching with signs out front. Hate you. We've had both. Huh? Am I their servant? I want to minister to them. I want to help them. But I'm God's servant. Right? I delight in serving him. And if I can please him, if I can be a servant to him, my faith will soar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he never forgets. Stand on your feet, everybody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Hallelujah.